I'm reminded of, you know, your quote, which was went something like genetics are not, I'm paraphrasing here, but they don't determine everything, but they, or you put it like this, genetics are not the only thing that matters, but they matter more than everything else combined, which yeah. is really just kind of a, a powerful statement worth really reflecting upon. And but it's really I, just restating what I said, that yeah. heritability, the extent of genetic influence is about 50%. And so um, that's that's where that comes from. But that does, that's um, a powerful way of saying it. Mm. And, and just to make sure people are up to speed, I just think it's an important um, fact that every cell in our body contains our entire genome, you know, just in case people are, are not aware of that. So that's why it's very easy to... Um, you know, get someone's entire DNA read and whole profile because you can simply take one cell, a cheek swab, a little saliva, and get their entire genetic blueprint. So, and then, it, you know, the way it works is that just different cells read different segments of the DNA sequence, but all of them contain the whole encyclopedia that is essentially the instruction manual for building you isn't that amazing to think about that though you know you start life as one cell mm. a fertilized egg a zygote and then from that one cell with its dna half from your mother half from your father it's the same dna in every cell in your body trillions of cells mm. and it's it is just amazing I think. amen i couldn't agree more <laughs> the Twin studies are, as you know, you have said, really a gift to science. Identical twins are a gift to science and a gift to the nature nurture conversation because they are genetic clones of each other. So is it fair to say that any differences whatsoever between identical twins must be due to environmental factors? Yes. And that's, I'm really glad you brought that up because genetics is defined very narrowly in behavioral genetics. It's defined as inherited, that is from your parents, inherited DNA differences that affect behavior. The environment is defined incredibly broadly. It's at literally everything else. It shouldn't be called environment. It should be called non-genetic mm -hmm. because there are a lot of non-genetic factors that involve DNA. Most cancers, for example, involve DNA. You know, like I'm a walking um, experiment case study for skin cancer because I love to be in the sun. I, I wish I were in California. That's why mm -hmm. I, I was earlier I was bemoaning to you the fact that the sun doesn't shine all that much in England where I am. Um, but um, skin cancers are caused by mutations in DNA. Like I have a spot here, I'm gonna to have to go in for it. It looks like it might be a little lesion on my arm here. Mm -hmm. And um, that is a DNA change that's initially starting that. You know, this, it, it, it causes mutations in your skin and then that continues to develop. Mm -hmm. But I'm not gonna, I didn't inherit it and I'm not gonna pass it on. The only mutations I pass on are those in my sperm. Right. So um, that is uh, an important distinction that genetics is defined very narrowly as inherited DNA differences. Mm -hmm. And the environment's defined much more broadly than psychologists ever do. It's everything else. And that includes accidents, illnesses, biology, all sorts of biological factors as well. So I think it's not just nurture in the sense of what your parents do. Right, right. That's a good point. Okay. So this is this is good. I, I want to to get in now to the question of how genes in, interact with the environment. And perhaps we can start by uh, me reading just a brief passage from Blueprint. So you wrote that. Um, let me see the perfect place to start. Psychological environments are not out there imposed on us passively. They are in here, experienced by us as we actively perceive, interpret, select, modify, and even create environments correlated with our genetic propensities. Our genetically rich differences in personality, psychopathology, and cognitive ability 
make us experience life differently. For example, genetic differences in children's aptitudes and appetites affect the extent to which they take advantage of educational opportunities. Genetic differences in vulnerability to depression affect the extent to which we interpret experiences positively or negatively. This is a general model for thinking about how we use the environment to get, and I love the way you put this, what our DNA blueprint whispers that it wants. This is the essence of the nature of nurture. So the nature- I think That's of, so important. I, I think it's one of the most important passages in the book, yet somehow as you were reading it, I wonder how your listeners react to that. It sounds a little bit like gobbledygook in a way at the beginning, but it's such a fundamental point. It's really worth mentioning that, you know, in psychology, um, beginning with Watson um, and the behaviorist, they wanted to move away from introspection and kind of philosophical approaches to psychology that existed before, you know, where you just kind of think real hard about what makes you do stuff. And he said, forget all that. Just look at behavior. And because you're doing that, it lent itself to environmentalism, because what you do is you take rats, as he did, and you do something, you shock them, or you do something like that. And so you have the stimulus, and you look at how the organism responds. And in those experiments, the environment is out there. The poor rat has nothing to do with whether it's in the experimental group or not, and whether it gets shocked or not. The environment's out there, it happens to the rat, independent of the rat. And that, that has governed the way we think about the environment. And yet, you know, with just a little bit of reflection, you realize in psychology, we don't study environments like that. Mm -hmm. You think of stress, for example, or parenting. Parenting is just behavior. Um, it, one thing I find, and so, you know, there's so much to say about this, but the environmental measures we use in psychology um, aren't environments out there. They're things that we are involved with. We're part of that experience right. so it's like i think experience is a better word than environment mm -hmm. and where this came out was in the mid 1980s I, I made a mistake once and in a twin study i did a twin analysis comparing identical and non-identical twins not of temperament which is what i was studying at the time but i did it of an environmental measure you know like how um, loving the twins perceive their parents to be. I was interested in, you know, whether parental support and uh, uh, control had much to do with their temperament. It turned out that in so-called environmental measure showed genetic influence. And that was the first of hundreds of studies that lead to this topic you mentioned, nature of nurture, and that's the idea. If you take environmental measures we use in psychology, most of them show significant genetic influence. And you know, if you didn't get that reading you just um, uh, went through, uh, it sounds crazy. How can an environmental measure have genetic influence because it doesn't have DNA? But it misses the point that the environment is not out there, it's in here. And it's our experience. And a lot of what drives our experience is genetics. Mm -hmm. And so um, a, a, a real example of the, a, a very concrete example that, that if you get this, you get the point, is that the, the single item about homes, environments that you can assess that will relate to kids' cognitive development is number of books in the home. And you know, makes sense, right? Kids have more books in the homes, they have a more intellectual environment, so they'll end up doing better at school and all of that. Well, that's, that's nurture, that's an environmental hypothesis, it's reasonable. But what if I tell you then, books in the home shows substantial genetic influence? Mm -hmm. Obviously books don't have DNA, but the issue is books don't just get there by themselves, someone put them there. And you know, parents who read a lot and are well-educated have more books in their home. But then if you say more educated parents have kids who do better at school, the genetic hypothesis begins to loom large. So this really has, can kind of turn the world upside down for you. If you just, just ask yourself when you read about stuff, like if you've got young parents, I, I was gonna do a next book on genetics and parenting, but someone else is doing it, so I decided not to. But um, you know, 
every week, every, you know, my blood pressure always goes up reading the news because you always read about stuff that's trying to make parents anxious. You know, parents who do this have kids who are screwed up or unless parents do this, the kids are gonna suffer. You know, it, it assumes environmental links, but just always ask yourself, wait a minute, what about genetics? Because these guys never do ask about it. You know, there are literally thousands of books on parenting and only one seriously discusses genetics. Mm. And I think the most important thing parents need to know is genetics. They don't have as much control as they think they have. And, you know, that's not just to say, again, it's not deterministic. It's just to say, uh, you, don't, you don't give up. You don't say there's nothing I can do. But it's like you don't have as much control over whether, um, say, your kid becomes schizophrenic or not. Well, that's a good thing because as a parent, you won't know your kid's schizophrenic until they're in their late teens or early 20s. And if you think you completely were in control of the kid's development, then you, you did that. And that's what parents used to be taught, you know, a told. Here your kid becomes schizophrenic. God, I did everything. And and you know how come? And it said, well, it's because of what you did. The Freudians would say it was what you did in the first few years of life, mostly mother blaming too. I mean, it's so bad, really, the that environmentalism. So I think it's so important that people just realize that environmental measures are not the environment out there. They show genetic influence. Yes. And then correlations between environmental measures and outcomes can be genetically mediated. And this isn't just to say, you know, ha ha, you got it wrong. It's really important yeah. that parents realize that these nurture effects are mostly genetic. They're genetic effects in disguise. Parents who have a lot of books in their home, you know, that's related to their kids' educational outcome primarily for genetic reasons. Mm. So, I, you know, so that's, I, I really get kind of, I get excited about this stuff because it is important and um, it's, it's, it's useful information too for parents because I think they're seriously misled by these parenting books. Well, that's, they're that's really actually, embugged by these books. That's, you know, they're always authoritarian. Doctor so and so says this, and right. the first thing, parent, it's so bad for psychology because you just grab six parenting books off the shelves in a bookstore, and you'll see completely contradictory things mm. said with equal authority mm. and never with data. <laughs> you know, so it, it, they're really bad for psychology. This was one of the one of my really I guess I would say this is what I was one thing I was affected by most in the book. And it was indeed one of those things that felt counterintuitive at first to me. Um, yet. So this point about how parents have less effect than they think on the outcome of who their child becomes and I, I have to say that the way that it affected me, I'm not even quite sure I can articulate it clearly, but I would say that it actually brought me a sense of peace. Uh, it soothed an anxiety that I think is the anxiety you're talking about when parents have this kind of basic belief that they are either to credit or to blame for who their kid becomes. And it, it just, again, it brought me as almost a strange sense of peace because I'm a parent myself. And the feeling I got was basically, I, again, I don't even know that I'm ready to articulate it, but it was essentially like the feeling like, I guess I can't really mess this up. <laughs> my Now, of course, you can think of extreme cases and that's where my mind yeah. goes right away. And so neglect, yeah. abuse, you'll Absolutely. mess something up, of course. But but just to realize how strong the genetic influence is on the trajectory of a child's life, it has. And I remember you wrote, "That's why you don't, you know, you want to go with the grain of their genetics instead of against the grain." And maybe that's that's part of what this is. This feeling is coming from too. Is you know, if my I can't force my child to like what I like or to fit my version of success he's going to he is who he is and there are very distinct characteristics about my son that i can already recognize and i'm not sure how they'll express later in life but there are very well-defined features that show up pretty early in life and there's a, there's just 
a lot of peace in accepting that and going with the grain of that in term and, and just providing them opportunities and being at peace with whatever choice they make, because again, they have this blueprint that is going to kind of push them to seize certain oppor opportunities and dismiss others.